We live in a world where anything is possible, where science, technology, and engineering have brought us out of the darkness of the night and into a new dawn of endless possibilities. Thousands of years have brought us to this point in history where modern medicine has helped us to prolong life and machines that learn help us to sustain the lands we depend on to survive. The world has also changed drastically and a world without science, without rules or laws could spell disaster for humanity. What then does the future hold for us if science sees to exist tomorrow? But what if instead it was music that ceased to exist? All right, kind of awkward without the music there. All right, well, before I get into things, I just wanted to thank you for indulging me in living out one of my childhood dreams of basically narrating my own extravaganza National Geographic film for you today. Now that trailer was accompanied by a really powerful musical score called Caves, which was composed by one of my favorite composers of all time, Grammy-nominated Cody Fry, who was very gracious enough to let me use his music for today's demonstration. Now, this question that I left up here, it seems a lot less daunting than trying to imagine a world without science. And that's the kind of idea that cognitive scientist Steven Pinker was getting at when he actually answered this question. And his take was that if music ceased to exist tomorrow, then the world would go on and remain unfazed and unchanged. Now today I want to ask you a different question, one that you might not have ever even thought of before. What do we lose in our lives when we remove music from it? Now Steven Pinker goes on to describe music as auditory cheesecake, that it is merely pleasurable and serves an aesthetic purpose, but it serves no real concrete or evolutionary purpose in society. And to be fair, if we eradicated cheesecake from the world tomorrow, we would probably go on just fine. But who would want to live in a world without cheesecake? I mean, think about it. It's delicious, it brings us pleasure, and it makes almost every situation we have it better. And quite similarly, when we listened to that trailer without the music, without the auditory cheesecake, we were left with this really bland emotional experience. And if you found that trailer as over the top and dramatic as I was trying to, it to, to make it be, then the music did its job perfectly. But today I want to ask another question to address Steven Pinker's criticism of music. I want to ask if music can be used and leveraged past its mere aesthetic and pleasurable purpose. In other words, how can we use this property of music, the music that we love to listen to and enjoy, towards healing? Now, I spend my days studying my brain on music as a PhD neuroscience student, and I spend my nights making music with my brain as a, uh, a composer, a songwriter, and a recording artist. And because I have my feet planted in both neuroscientific and musical worlds, I find myself in this really unique and privileged position today to talk to you about the objective power that music holds in our world. And today I want to talk about two main ideas that are informed by these scientific and musical worlds that I think illustrates this perfectly. And they are that the emotional power of music can influence your brain's natural reward networks and that music can be leveraged to heal. Now, it's these days I get to approach this conversation and these ideas through more of a neuroscientific lens. But what really got me asking these questions in the first place was when I discovered my power as a songwriter. So I want to start off today with a little bit of a musical demonstration to illustrate this first point, that the emotional power of music can influence your brain's natural reward networks. So a couple of years ago, way back when, I wrote a musical with my family, and I wanted to play a song for you that we wrote in that musical, and that song is called If I Could. Now in this song, we meet the character who's singing it in a really desperate place, that he's found out that his wife is stuck in the hospital, he was rushed to the hospital because of an emergency, and now he's pouring his heart out, saying all the things that he wished he could have said and done if he was with her in that moment. And it kind of goes like this. If I could, I'd buy you a thousand red apples 
If that meant I could see you a thousand more days If I could, I'd hold you Tell you love conquers all Then why do I feel so small If I could So I wrote that song again almost a decade ago and this song is one that so many people go back to and tell me makes them cry over and over again. And it, this was really an illustration of how powerful music can really be to tap into these, these dark and deep emotions in us. Now, we'll call what I just played Chorus A. And I'll play it again, but this time without the singing so that you can hear the melody a little bit better. Great, so as the song goes on, we actually reach a chorus B. And this chorus B uh, reaches, is, reaches a point in the song where the character is way more desperate, and now he's calling out and pleading, and it sounds like this. For you I will do whatever it takes For you're my dream And I'm wide awake So the song goes on and it, it swells and it's more painstaking and you might have noticed a couple different things there that in chorus B, between chorus A and B, chorus B is a lot more loud and it's a lot more harrowing and it's a lot more emotionally stirring. But what you might not have noticed is that the melody line in both choruses A and B are almost identical. The only thing that I changed was the context that surrounded it. So again, I'm going to play chorus A for you, and I played it into what we call a major mode in music. So it's a little bit more predictable and safe. But in the second chorus, despite it also being louder, I also changed the chords that, that accompanied it, and I played it in a minor mode. And so this is the first time that you might think, wow, Mikey, you really tricked us, and you subverted our expectations. You violated our trust a little bit here. But that actually wasn't the first time. I actually set you up with a couple of cues that led to that moment. And it started with this chord right here. And that chord kind of sounds really ugly on its own. And we call that dissonance in music. And it's supposed to be ugly because we're trying to get to a place of resolution. So it goes from here to here. And so here, we kind of reach a more predictable place. And we think, OK, now we're going to end in a, in a place that sounds more predictable, like this. Which is in a major mode, which is exactly how chorus A ended. But in fact, as spoiler alert, as you know, I ended it in a, in a minor chord. So in this process of manipulating your expectations and bringing you to a, a place where you think you're going to get resolution um, is where reward actually stems from in music. And finally, at the end of the song, I actually give you the resolution that you were seeking for. Oh, I wish I could write it. Some other way to show you my love every day if I could. So we finally end the song in that major chord, that resolution that we were expecting in the first place. And I realized that this is where music's emotional and rewarding power comes from. There is a neuroscientific concept that explains what just happened here, and it's called reward prediction error, or RPE. So in a nutshell, reward prediction error is it explains the difference between what we expect, our expectations, and what actually happens. And so the ultimate goal for us is to seek and settle this difference, to help us to seek resolution and reinforce our learning on what things lead to certain favorable outcomes. And this is also known as reinforcement learning. Now, reward prediction error in music, or RPEs, is kind of what we just experienced. We are expecting something to end pleasantly, but instead we got some kind of surprise, some kind of dissonance. And this could also take the form in you know, a surprise, unexpected bridge in that favorite rock song that you like to rock out to in your car. And so again, the difference is seeking this musical resolution. What's going to happen next? And this is what leads to these rewarding experiences. Now, RPE 
Now, RPEs have been looked at in the context of other rewarding stimuli like drugs and food, but RPE and music have also been looked at. So what these researchers found is that when you manipulate uh, musical RPEs, for instance, if I played something more predictable like Happy Birthday, but instead I change the ending to something that's a little bit less predictable, then what you actually see is increased activity in a part of your brain called the nucleus accumbens. And the nucleus accumbens is a central and in, in integral part of your brain's reward networks. It helps to process reward in your brain, like RPEs. Now, interestingly, the behavioral aspects of this study have also shown that participants were implicitly seeking and learning to seek these pleasant endings after a mix of unpleasant and pleasant endings. And though work, more work needs to be done in this area of research, this has just come out in the last three or four years, this is preliminary evidence that supports this running theory that we've been talking about, that in searching for resolution, it seemed that RPEs, or this, this discrepancy between expectation and what actually happens, helped participants learn what were more favorable musical outcomes. Now, more research in this realm has gone on to include the auditory cortex, or the parts of the brain that processes sound, and also prediction for these musical reward and prediction models. Now we've kind of gone through some of the mechanisms of how this can happen in our brains. But so what? We're trying to address and prove Steven Pinker wrong that music can be used more and, and past its mere aesthetic value. And that's the last concept that I want to talk about today, that music can be leveraged to heal. Now I want to ask you a question again. What would we lose in our lives when we take away music from it? Now I'm here to argue that in the clinical and medical settings, we would lose a whole lot of untapped potential to facilitate healing in the brain using music. And to bring this idea home today, to quite literally bring this home, I want to introduce you to my grandma, Lola Des. Now my Lola, as you can see in this picture, is she looks fantastic for 86. But she lives with Alzheimer's disease and with dementia. And with the passing of my grandpa, my Lolo, a couple of years ago, she started experiencing periods of depression and apathy. Now, when I was growing up, my Lolo would dance in her living room with my Lolo, and they absolutely loved music. But when I visited her last summer in California, she spent most of her days sitting on her couch, um, relatively not moving, her mood subdued, and repeating phrases over and over again throughout the day, which is a hallmark of Alzheimer's disease. Now I thought, let's put my money where my mouth is. And I worked on making a playlist with my aunt of all of my Lola's favorite songs when she was growing up, including songs that she enjoys to listen to now. And we played it for her every day. And so the audio was off in this video, but as you can see, my Lola can still break some serious moves. And you can see her dancing with my mom here in her living room, like what she used to with, her, with my Lola when she was alive. Now it seemed that music was facilitating this difference from what she was doing even five minutes ago. That music that she found enjoyable, that she found rewarding, actually got her off of her feet and mooded, lifted her mood almost instantaneously. Now this idea that music can be leveraged to heal is not a new idea. In fact, it's been used for centuries, for millennia, that music has been used as a tool to heal. But the systematic validation of using music in medicine, in modern medicine, and understanding the mechanisms that allows music to, to make this impact in our brains is relatively, is relatively new. And this is something that I hope to help contribute to. Now researchers have what they call the big question that they use to drive them forward in their research. And my big question is how can understanding this music and brain interaction be used to validate and transform the way that we see music as a tool to heal? And that's led me to start uh, my pilot research project that's starting soon, that's using rewarding music to target apathy in Parkinson's disease. So we've established that music can tap into our brain's natural reward networks. But these same networks are actually damaged in a subset of people with chronic brain disorders like Parkinson's disease. Now Parkinson's disease, as you might know it, is more related to motor symptoms like tremor or rigidity. But it so happens that most people with Parkinson's disease also have non-motor symptoms, things like apathy or a loss of motivation to initiate activities like even standing up or, or going for a walk. So you have the storm brewing in Parkinson's patients 
that those who already have motor symptoms, who already have trouble moving, are less encouraged to move because of their apathy and less motivated, which leads to uh, decreased quality of life and more treatment resistance. And what makes matters worse is that there's no drug that is approved to target apathy in Parkinson's disease because of all these off-target effects that these drugs have. So we know that music can target the motor symptoms of Parkinson's, that music and the beat of music can actually drive participants to align their inner rhythms with outer rhythms so that they can align their gait or their walking patterns in Parkinson's. So why not target the non-motor symptoms, the apathy in Parkinson's, to increase motivation, to increase better quality of life, and to lead to better treatment responses? Now, I know that this study that I'm, I'm talking about today is also really in its beginning stages. But if you look at the larger puzzle, we actually already have the other pieces. In fact, we know that music therapy has helped people with other chronic brain disorders, things like a dementia, Alzheimer's disease like myelola, autism, schizophrenia, depression, anxiety, and so many more. Understanding how music impacts the brain is already being fitted in and developed as we speak. And it'll help us fit in more pieces to this puzzle, understanding how to further develop better forms of music-based interventions. And what's so amazing about it is that music exists. It's non-invasive. It's so easy to administer. All we need to do is use it. So at the nexus of music and neuroscience is emotion, reward, and healing. I hope that through this talk, we've gone through this journey of talking about music and its power in, a, in our world in objective terms, seeing how music expectation and reward can be leveraged into healing. Now, let's return to our question from the very beginning and revisit Steven Pinker's take that music could disappear from the world tomorrow and our lives would basically remain unfazed and unchanged. Now, let me ask you this question. Has this opinion, has your opinion on this changed from the beginning of this conversation when I first posed this question? Now, I hope that you've seen through this talk that music matters, that this auditory cheesecake can be pleasurable, delightful, and rewarding, but it can also hold more nutrients than we ever thought they could have. Now, lucky for us, we do live in a world filled with music, which means that we have an arguably unlimited resource to tap in and to fill our lives with reward, joy, and healing. Now all we have to do is see its value and use it. I'd like to thank and acknowledge Rick's Heart Foundation, BC Brain Wellness Program, and the Pacific Parkinson's Research Center for funding this research and for creating a world where neuroscience research matters. Thank you. Thank you.